Hi, thanks for joining me in this video on Northern Illinois University's College of Business Ethics Program called the BELIEF Program. BELIEF stands for Building Ethical Leaders Using an Integrated Ethics Framework. I'm Pam Smith and I'm the KPMG Professor of Accountancy at NIU. The purpose of this video is to give you an overview of the BELIEF Program and how it can be used in your everyday life. The program has received many accolades over the years because of its pragmatic approach that we take in helping you, our students, recognize ethical pitfalls. More importantly, the BELIEF program helps you pave your way to success. It does that by helping you with two key things in your life. One, learn how to navigate ethical challenges, especially those that do not have right or wrong answers. And two, help you think about how to give voice to your values in those situations when your values are challenged. The BELIEF program promotes Northern Illinois University College of Business values. Those values apply to faculty, staff, administrators, and you, my friends. You can never go wrong living your life by these simple values. Excellence in what you do, integrity in how you do it, and caring in how you treat others. The BELIEF program is really a double entendre. And what that means is we have a fundamental belief that people want to do the right thing, including you. We believe in you and we know that you want to do the right thing. But we also know that good people make bad decisions and sometimes those bad decisions don't have do-overs and the consequences can be severe. So what will help? Well, what we've done is we've purposefully developed the program to help you with two things. Increase your awareness of ethical dilemmas and two, provide a really strong framework for decisions. Because at this point in your life, we're not trying to teach you morals and values. You already have that. You want to be able to have increased awareness through recognition of the impact of your actions on others. And we're going to do that by engaging you in conversations about the dilemmas. And often, those dilemmas aren't even recognized. And the second thing we're going to do is we'll give you a framework to help you with the decisions. It's going to help you develop maybe like personal scripts to help you to figure out what to do when you don't know what to do. So let's first talk about awareness. How do you know that there may be a potential issue? Well, there's a combination of three things. One is motivation. Actually, that's good. People are motivated to do things and we really applaud that. And two, there's opportunities associated with those motivations in order to achieve that goal, whether it's to get a good grade or make more money or whatever it is. The third component that overlaps with motivation and opportunity is really where some problems can come in, and that is rationalization. So what is rationalization? It's really our core consciousness trying to justify a behavior or action to make us kind of feel better about that decision. It doesn't sit right, but what we do is we rationalize it away with statements like, well, only this once. I'm just doing what I'm told. It's really none of my business. Nobody's really going to notice. Hey, I really deserve this. The granddaddy of all rationalizations was stated by Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway. He says, the five most dangerous words in business are, and I bet you've said it as well, those words are, everyone else is doing it. Anytime you hear yourself rationalizing, I want you to stop and think and have strobe lights go off in your mind that you really need to stop and think about the decision or the actions that are happening around you because you are rationalizing related to those decisions. To strengthen decision making, we've developed a simple yet powerful decision making guide. It's on this credit card size card and it's meant for you to keep and put in your wallet and hang on to it. On the back is the actual decision making guide that I'm going to go through. In the handbook is a discussion of that decision making guide. So what is the decision making guide? First, determine the facts and identify the issue. Two, who's the stakeholders? Who's being affected by this decision? Three, identify the relevant factors. You know, is this within the context of a workplace or a school place? Are there rules and regulations around what's going on? And next, list three to five options. And notice we don't say two options because option one and two are usually really, really easy. If you think enough to come up with three to five options, that means you're really putting some thought into how could I solve this dilemma that I'm facing. And then you make a tentative choice. Once you've identified your options, these tests are designed to help you look at each option from 360 degrees. What are the tests? Harm test. Is anybody going to be hurt from this test? 
Legal test, is it against the law? Precedent test, am I setting a precedent where I have to do this again? Publicity test, what if my decision was on the front page of the newspaper? Defensibility, could I defend it in a court of law, my decision? Mom test or dad test, what would mom or dad say if they knew of this action or behavior? Reversibility test, what if it was happening to me? What if the circumstances were reversed and the situation was happening to me then the other way around? Virtues, what does it do to me as an individual if I actually engage in this behavior? What would my profession say is the professional test? Peer or colleague test, what would my friends think of this decision? And the organization test, the entity in which I operate, how would they view this action? And I think the most important, how does it make me feel? If it makes you feel uncomfortable, you really need to stop and really think about this action behavior or thing that you're witnessing. So what could you do? So let's just think about this a minute. You're faced with dilemmas all the time. One of them might be that you now are 21 and your roommate is underage and they ask you to buy beer. That's a dilemma, my friends. What could you do? Well, you could buy the beer. You could not buy the beer. Those are the first two easy ones, right? That's why we tell you to come up with three to five. Tell them to ask somebody else. Explain that you're not comfortable buying the beer. And then you could also pretend like you didn't hear them. So my whole point of this is, is when you're faced with dilemmas, you're going to go feel a little, you're going to, your rationalization is going to start happening. You're going to recognize that you've got a dilemma and really think through each one of your options using the test so that you can come up with a way in order to respond to that request. And if you think about it in advance, you're going to come up with those personal scripts where you say, hey, you know what, I really don't feel comfortable doing this. You do things with a warm heart, people are going to understand what your values are and what you're standing up for. So here's a couple other really quick examples. Let's say a researcher makes up some data points and adds those observations to a study so that the drug can be approved. What do you think of that? He just makes data up. What do you think if that drug proves effective and it saves a lot of lives? Does that change your mind? Do you think that it's justified for the researcher to make up those data points? What if it was one of your family members that was saved by that drug? Does that change your mind? Now let's change that just a little bit. Assume that the researcher doesn't make up data points, but there were four that were taken out of the study because of a technicality. And he adds those four observations back into his study, and the results are that the drug is approved. Now what do you think of his behavior? He didn't make it up out of the blue, he just actually added four real live data points that were excluded because of a technicality. Is this better or worse than the previous researcher? Think about that. So now let's say the drug is proven ineffective, it has unanticipated side effects, and it leads to a death or disability of an individual. Do you think this researcher's behavior is more or less ethical than in the previous scenario? What if it was one of your family members who died because of the side effect of that drug? My whole point on this is that a lot of times the outcome of the action is going to impact our decision on how ethical that action is. I want to share with you another situation in which you may change your decision on something depending on the outcome. So what you have in the screen in front of you is a trolley going down a railroad track. Pardon my drawing, but that's what it is. It's a trolley going down a railroad track. It's out of control and there's a bunch of people on that track. And you are standing right next to the switch, which you could pull that switch. And if you pulled the switch, the trolley would divert to the left, and there's only one person on the track there. The question is, would you pull the switch? Well, this has been researched in cognitive psychology over and over and over again, and just about the entire population would pull the switch, save all the people that are going to be run over by the trolley, and the trolley would go down that one track, and essentially you're sacrificing one person. Now, of course, I know you guys, you're thinking, well, I would do this, I would do this, I'd yell at them. That's not what the, what the scenario is trying to get at. It's just, what would you do? So now let's look at another scenario. Now, the same trolley is out of control, coming down the track, and the, there's people on the track. You're on a footbridge over the top of that track, and next to you is a person with a backpack. Yeah, that's a person with a backpack on them. If you were to push that person over the bridge, they, and with their backpack, would be enough to slow down the trolley and it would save all the people. Would you do that? Probably not. The majority of the population in cognitive psychology, when this test has been done, would not do it. 
What's the difference? That you are directly involved in pushing the person over the bridge versus pulling the switch on the trolley. So I want you to think about that a little bit. That really applies to times when you're seeing things happening, like maybe somebody cheating on an exam or doing something like that, and not being directly involved in it and saying, oh, it's not any of my business. Well, sometimes things are not any of your business, but sometimes being involved is really the way to exercise and voice your values. What I've just demonstrated are blind spots. Cognitive psychology has shown that humans have limitations. Behavioral ethics research has found that most people want to act ethically, just as you do. Yet we still find ourselves engaging in unethical behavior because of the biases that influence our decisions. Well, one of those biases is outcome bias. The end justifies the means. And we saw that with the researcher. Well, it's okay if the researcher fudges some of the data points if it saved one of my family members' lives. Anchoring. Sometimes we get so anchored on the certain facts, it's really difficult to see other points of view. A real common one, especially at the university level and as well as in other organizations, is groupthink. Going with the crowd. You really don't want to go against what your peers are doing. Overconfidence. That's the way it's done or it won't happen to me. You know, the next time you get in the car after you've had a few beers to drink, I really want you to think about it. You probably have overconfidence. I can handle this. I can drive this vehicle. My friends, every day we find, uh, we find instances where people have been killed and there's been injuries and drunk driving. Please, please think twice before you get behind the wheel if you've had anything to drink. Confirmation biases means that we value confirming evidence more than disconfirming evidence. So I want to do a little bit of a, a, a fun thing with you, and that is sometimes our mind only sees some things. So on this screen, what do you see? The old lady or the young woman? What do you see in the Baskin Robbins logo? Do you see the 31? In this next one, what do you see in that Big Ten logo? Do you see the 11? And in Goodwill, do you see that half of that G is a smiling face? And, of course, most people are familiar with FedEx and the arrow in there. The Pittsburgh Zoo was quite creative with their logo. Do you see the gorilla and the tiger? And Tostitos is one of my most favorite ones. Do you see the two guys having the party in the middle? Now, what can you do? What you really need to do is consider other points of view. Our decision-making guide really helps you in doing that. Recognizing your own limitations. Sometimes I don't know all the answers, so I have to seek help, guidance, and mentoring. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. You also need to consider unintended consequences, and that's hard to think of because you don't really think that something is going to happen. When you bought your, that beer for your roommate, he, he's going to be fine. He can drink beer. But sometimes you really need to think through what kinds of consequences could happen. When you make a mistake, and you will, own up to it and learn from it. Moral courage is putting your beliefs into action, doing what you believe in in the face of a difficult situation. Developing moral courage takes place through conduct in your everyday life. I encourage you to live your life with the simple values that we're promoting here at the College of Business. Excellence in what you do every day, no matter how small the task or the assignment. Integrity in how you do it. Don't compromise your values. Caring in how you treat others. There's no reason to not take a caring and a kind approach in how you are treating others on a daily basis. I may see you in a lecture sometime if you're an accountancy major. In the meantime, take good care of yourself and I will see you soon.